Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Trinity School at the Brewery, junior production of Moliere's The Boudoir Gentleman. As the production ensues, we ask that you refrain from class photography, as that would be a thoroughly middle class thing to do. And that you would, <laughs> as people of quality, sign up for cell phones and all other sundry noises. If you will need a breather in the face of the sheer fire of the fine pack culture, there will be a 10 minute intermission. Thank you. Enjoy the show. Is it done? Yes. Let's see. Is it something new? Yes, it's a melody for a serenade that I set in here to composing while waiting for a man to awake. May I see it? You'll hear it with the dialogue when he comes. He won't be long. Our work, George and mine, is not trivial at present. This is true. We found here such a man as we both knew. This is a nice source of income for us. This Monsieur Jordan with visions of nobility and gallantry that he has gotten into his head. You and I should hope that everyone resembles him. Not entirely. I can wish that he better understood the things that we give him. It's true that he understands them poorly, but he pays well, and that's what our art needs now more than anything else. As for me, I admit, I feel the love of glory. Applause touches me, and I hold that in all the fine arts, it is painful to use for adults to endure the barbarous opinions of a fool about my choreography. It is a pleasure, don't tell me otherwise, to work for someone who can appreciate the fine points of art, who knows how to give sweet receptions to the views of work, and, by pleasurable affirmations, gratifies us for our labor. Yes, the most agreeable recompense we can receive for the things we do is to see them recognized and flattered by an applause on our hands. There is nothing, in my opinion, that pays better for all our fatigue. And it is an exquisite delight to work for the praises of the well informed. Mm, I agree, and I enjoy them as you do. There is nothing so agreeable as the applause you speak of. But incense does not provide a living. Pure praises do not provide a comfortable existence. It is necessary to add something solid. The best way to praise is to praise with cash in hand. He's a man, it's true, <laughs> whose insight is very slight, who talks nonsense about everything and applauds only for the wrong reasons. But his money makes up for his judgments. He has discernment in his purse. His praises are in cash, and his ignorant bourgeois is worth more to us than the educated nobleman that introduced us here. There is some truth to what you say, but I find that you lean too heavily on money, and material taste is something so base that a man of good taste should show no attachment to it. You are ready enough to receive the money our man gives you. Assuredly, but I don't place all my happiness in it, and I can wish that, together with his good fortune, he had some good taste in things. I could wish it too, and that's what both of us are working for as much as we can. But in any case, he gives us the means to make ourselves known in the world, and he will pay others if they will praise him. Here he comes. Well, gentlemen, what is this? Are you going to show me your little skit? How? What little skit? Well, the, what do you call it? The prologue or dialogue of songs and dances. Oh, you find us ready for you. I kept you waiting, though, but that's because I'm holding myself just the people of quality. And my killer sent me some so stuck <laughs> that I thought I'd never get off. We are here only to wait upon your leisure. I want you both to stay until I have brought you my suit so that you can see me. You shall see me fitted out properly from head to foot. It's marvelously becoming. I had this robe made for me. It's very attractive. My killer says that you look all to be dressed like this in the morning. Yes, hey, lackeys. Yes, sir. Two lackeys. Nothing. I just want to see if you're paying attention. <laughs> Let's say with my liveries. They're magnificent. Here again is a sort of lounging dress which I wear for my morning exercise. <laughs> it is very elegant. Lackey? Yes, sir. The other lackey? Yes, sir. Hold my robe. You think I look good? Oh, very well. No one could look better. 
Now, let's have a look at the proposal, shall we? I would like very much for you to listen to a melody that he has composed for the serenade that he ordered for me. He's one of my pupils who has an admirable talent for these kinds of things. Yes, but you should not have had that done by a pupil. You yourself are not too good for that piece of work. You must not let the name of pupil fool you, sir. Pupils of this sort know just as much as the greatest masters, and the melody is as fine as could be made. Just listen. Bring me my robes so that I can listen better. Would you like to see our pieces? 
No, that is for later. When the person I ordered this for is to do me the honor of coming here to die. However, sir, that is not enough. A person like you, who lives magnificently and who is inclined towards fine things, should have a concert of music here every Wednesday or every Thursday. And is that what people of quality do? Yes, sir. Then I shall have them. Will it be fine? Without a doubt. You must have four voices. A soprano, alto, tenor, and bass. We'll be accompanied by a bass viol, a thurible, and a clavecin for the chords, with two violins playing versions. You must also add a trumpet marine, for the trumpet marine is an instrument that pleases me, and it's harmonious. Leave it to us to manage things. And don't forget to send the musicians to sing that table. You will have everything you should have. And above all, let the ballet be fine. You will be pleased with it, and among other things, with certain minuets you will find in it. Ah, minuets are my dance, and I'd like you to watch me dance them. Come, my dancing master. I have, sir, to please. Uh, aha. <laughs> lock, 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 please, please, lock, 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 you right arm, lock, 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 right leg, lock, 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 don't move your shoulders so, lock, 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 turn your toe off, lock, 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 raise your head up, Lock, 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 straighten your body up. How did I do? Oh, you did my business. By the way, teach me how to bow to salute a marchioness. I shall need to know soon. How you must bow to salute a marchioness? Yes, a marchioness named Dorine. Give me your hand. No, you have only to do it. I shall remember it well. If you wish to greet her with a great deal of respect, you must first bow, then take a step back, then bow three times as you walk towards her, and at the last, bow to her knees. Do it, son. Good. Sir, your fencing master is here. Tell him to come in for my lesson. I want you to see me perform. Come, sir. The salute. Your legs not so wide apart. Your feet are in line. Your wrist opposite the head. One of the shoulders is in the shoulder. The arm not so much extended. The left hand has the level of your eyes. The left shoulder is more square. The other is pressing all the bands. Be cut tight and thrust. What the true cause of again? Foot burn. Be back, sir. You make the grass, you must first disengage, and your body must be well turned. One, two, come. Be tierce and thrust. Advance, stop there. Recover, repeat. Be back. And guard time, guard. How is that? On the best. I love rising two things to give and not to receive. As I demonstrated to you the other day, it is impossible to receive if you know how to turn your point of sword from the line of your body. This relies solely on a slight movement of the wrist, either inward or outward. In this way, the man without courage is sure to kill his opponent and not be killed himself. Without doubt. Didn't you see the demonstration? Yes. And thus you have seen why men like me should be considered by the state, while the science of fencing is more important than all the other useful sciences. Such as music or dancing. Be careful, sir. Speak of the dance only with respect. I beg you to speak better of the excellence of music. You are music fellows. It's probably the great world science of mine. See the self importance of the man. My little dancing master, I'll make you dance as you ought. My little musician, I'll make you sing a free way. Monsieur Clanger of Iron, I'll teach you your trade. You crazy to quarrel with him? Who knows? Tears in court. We can kill a man by demonstration. I disdain his demonstrations and his tears. This court. Be careful! I'm done for my demonstration. More course. I'm done for my demonstration. 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 Oh, Monsieur Philosopher, you come just in time with your philosophy. You come to make a little peace among these people. What's happening? What's the matter, gentlemen? 
They have gotten into a rage about the superiority of the profession to the point of injurious words and wanting to come to blows. What? Gentlemen, must you act this way? Haven't you read the learned treatise Seneca composed on anger? Is there anything more base and more shameful than this passion which turns a man into a savage beast? And shouldn't reason be the mistress of all our activities? Well, sir, he has abused both of us by despising the dance, which is my profession, and music, which is his profession. A wise man is above all the insult that can be spoken. And the grand reply one should make to such outrages is moderation and patience. They both had the audacity to try and compare their professions with mine. Should that disturb you, men should not dispute amongst themselves about vainglory and rank. That which perfectly distinguishes one from another is wisdom and virtue. I insist to him that the dance is an art to which one cannot give enough honor. And I, that music is something that all the ages have revered. And I insist that the science of fencing is the finest and most necessary of all the sciences. <laughs> and where, then, will philosophy be? I find you all very impertinent to speak with such arrogance in front of me. And impudent to give the name of science to things that one should not even honor with the name of art, and that cannot be classified Except under miserable gladiator, <laughs> singers, and buffoon! Get out, you talkless Get out, you worthless man! What rascal you are! <laughs>
And yes, therefore, I must tell you, letters are divided into vowels, called vowels, because they express the voice, and into consonants, because they sound with the vowels and mark the distinct articulations of the voice. There are five vowels or voices. O and E O U. I understand all that. The vowel A is for my opening up widely. Ah! <laughs> its vowels are the unique sounds used in vocalizing A, A, E, O, U. Ah! Ah, yes! The vowel E is for my approaching the lower jaw to the upper. A, A! A, A! A, A! A, A! By my face, yes! Oh, how fine! The vowel I is formed by approaching the, bringing the jaws still near together, stretching the two corners of the lips towards the ears. Ah, eh, e. Ah, eh, e. 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 That is true. Oh, my lips, science. <laughs> Jaws and drawing down the two corners of the lips, up and lower. Oh! 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 There's nothing sure. Ah, eh, e, o, e, o, e, o, e, o. That's admirable. E, o, e, o. The opening of mouth happens to make a little circle. Which represents an O. <coughs> oh. oh, oh, that is true. Oh. Oh. <laughs> the vowel U is formed by bringing the teeth nearly together and thrusting the lips outward. Also, bringing them nearly together without completely joining them. Nicole, bring me my slippers and my cap. That's 
Rose? Yes, sir. By my faith! For more than 40 years I've been speaking prose without knowing anything of it. <laughs> I want the letter say, Beautiful Marchioness, your lovely eyes may be dowry of love. But be put down, sweetie, and be nicely turned. Put it up. The fires of her eyes reduce your heart to cinders. You suffer night and day the torments of a rain. No, 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 no. I want none of that. I only want the note to say, Beautiful Marchness, your lovely eyes make me die of love. The thing requires a little length. No, I tell you. I only want those words in the letter. But be gallantly put and rearranged as is necessary. <laughs> Please tell me, just to see, the diverse ways they can be put. Why don't you go put them as you can say them? Beautiful Marchioness, your lovely eyes make me die of love. Or else, of love to die make me, beautiful Marchioness, your beautiful eyes. <laughs> or else, your lovely eyes of love make me, beautiful Marchioness, die. <laughs> Four, one, two, three, 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 four, one
four, one, two, three, 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 four, one. My dear gentlemen, please forgive the apprentices of small tip. What did you call me? My dear gentlemen. My dear gentlemen, that is what you get for dressing up people of quality. Go your whole life just like a bourgeois, and you'll never be called my dear gentlemen. Here, take this for the my dear gentlemen. My lord, we are very much obliged to you. My lord, oh, wait, my friend. My lord deserves something. Or it's not a little word, this my lord. Here, take this, for that's what my lord gives you. My lord, we will drink to the health of your grace. Your grace! <laughs> oh, 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 wait, don't go. To me, your grace. By my faith, if he goes as far as to say, hey, she shall have my entire purse. Wait, that is for my grace. My lord, we thank you very humbly for your liberality. <laughs> He did very well. I was going to give him everything. <laughs> Follow me, both of you. I'm going to show my new clothes about town a little. And above all, make sure to look loosely at my heels so people know that you are with me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Call Nicole for me. I have some orders to give her. Don't bother. There she is. Nicole? Yes, sir. Listen. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you laughing? Oh, oh my god, uh, How is that? <laughs> oh, Lord. What kind of little baggage is this? <laughs> are you mocking me? Certainly not, sir. I should be very sorry to do so. I'll give you a smack <laughs> on the nose if you go on laughing. <laughs> but you're so funny that I can't help laughing. You are not going to stop? <laughs> I'll... Please. <laughs> Listen, if you go on laughing, even the tiniest bit, I swear, I'll give you the biggest slap ever given. All right, sir. All right, it's time. I won't laugh anymore. Good. Presently, you must clean. You must clean. You must, I say, clean the room and... Again! I'm furious. Oh, sir. I beg you to let me laugh. If I catch you. Sir, if I don't laugh, I'll let you all burst. Who's ever seen such a maid as this who laughs at my face instead of receiving my orders? All right, sir. It's done. What would you have me do? With that, you should consider doing my house ready for the company I have coming soon, you hussy. Oh, but my faith, I don't feel like laughing anymore. All the guests who have made such a disorder with the word company is not to put anyone in a bad humor. Why? Should I close my doors to everyone for your sake? You should at least shut to some people. Ah, ah, here's a new story. What's this? What's this, husband? This outfit you have on there? Don't you care what people think of you? And do you want yourself laughed at everywhere? Don't be fools. Adults will laugh at me, wife. Truly, they haven't waited until now. Your antics have long been a laugh to everyone. And who is everyone, if you please? Everyone is everyone who is right. And who is wiser than you. For my part, I am scandalized at the life you lead. I no longer recognize our house. One would say it's the beginning of a carnival here every day, and beginning early in the morning so it won't be forgotten. One hears nothing but the record of fiddles and singers which disturbs the whole neighborhood. Madame speaks well. I'll never be able to get my housework done properly with that gang out from here. They have thieves that hunt for mud in every part of town to bring here. And poor Francois, I like to teeth on the floor, scrubbing the words of your fine masters, come to dirty up every day. What? Our servant Nicole, you have quite the tongue for a peasant. Nicole so. is right, and she has more sense than you. I'd like to know what you think you're going to do with the dancing master at your age, and with a hulking fencing master who comes to dance with his feet, shaking the whole house, and tearing all the floorboards in our drawing room. You are both ignorant women. 
You don't see the advantages of all this. You should instead be thinking of marrying off your daughter, who's of an age to be provided for. Don't think of marrying off my daughter when a suitable match comes along. But I also want to learn about fine things. I heard Sam Dunn today. He took a philosophy master. Very well. I have a wish to have wit and to reason about things with decent people. Don't you intend, one of these days, to go to school and have yourself whipped at your age? Why not? If I were to be whipped right this minute in front of everyone, if only I knew what they learned in school. Yes, my babe. That would get you muttershed. Oh, without a doubt. All this is very important to the management of your household. Assuredly. You both talk like beasts, and I'm ashamed of your ignorance. For example, do you know what it is you are saying here now? Yes, I know what I'm saying is well said, and that you ought to be considering living another way. I'm not talking about that. I'm asking you what are the words that you are speaking here. They are words that are very sensible, and your conduct is scarcely so. I'm not talking about that, I tell you. I'm asking what is it that I'm speaking right this minute? What is it? Nonsense. <laughs> That's not it. What is it we are both speaking? What language is it that we are saying? Well... What is it called? It's called whatever you'd like. It's prose, you ignorant woman. <laughs> prose? Yes, prose. Everything is prose. That is not verse. And everything that is verse is not prose. There. That is what it means to study. And you. You know what you must do to say ooh. What? Say ooh in order to see. Oh, well, ooh. What do you do? I say ooh. Yes, because when you say ooh, what do you do? I do what you tell me to. So how strange it is to have to deal with morons. Trust your lips out. See? Ooh. 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 Do you see? I make a pout. Yes, that's beautiful. How admirable it is. It's quite another thing if you've seen O and D, Dot and F. What is all this rigmarole? What are you going to do for us? It enrages me when I see these ignorant women. Go, go. You ought to send all those people packing with their foolishness. And above all, the great hulk of a fencing master who ruins all my work with dust. This fencing master seems to get under your skin. I'll soon show you how impertinent you are. There. Demonstration. The line of the body. When your opponent thrusts in court, you have only to do this. And when your opponent thrusts in tears, you have only to do this. That is the way never to be killed in your, by your opponent. Is it a fine thing to be assured that one does when facing against someone? There. Thrust at me a little. Oh, well. Oh, wait. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> the mercy, mercy, mercy. <laughs> Don't confound you, woman. You told me to trust. Yes, but you thrust me tears before you thrust me court. You did not have the patience to let me parry. You are a fool, husband, with all your fantasies. And all this has come to you since you took the notion to associate with the nobility. When I associate with the nobility, I show my good judgment and further associate with your shop keepers. Oh, yes, truly. There's a great deal to gain in the consorting with your nobles. And you did so well with that fine count of yours you were so taken with. Peace. Think of what you are saying. You know very well, life, that you don't know who you're talking about. He's a more important person than you think. A great lord, respected in court, and who talks to the king just as I talk to you now. Almost. Is it not an honor that the person of this quality comes to my house so often? You're causing his dear friend and treats me as if I were his equal. And in front of everyone. He shows me so much affection that I 
spares myself. Yes, he has a kindness for you and shows his affection, but he borrows your money. So? Is it not an honor to lend money to a man of this condition? A great lord who calls you his dear friend. And this lord, what does he do for you? Things that would astonish you if you knew what they were. Like what? Like... Blast! I cannot explain myself. It must suffice that I have lent him money, he will pay it back both, and before long. Yes, you are waiting for that. The surely, didn't he tell me so? Yes, yes, he won't fail to do it. Swart on the faith of a gentleman. Nonsense. You are very obstinate, wife. I tell you, he will keep his word. I'm sure of it. And I'm sure he will not. And that his show of affection is only to flatter you. Be still. Here he is. It's all we needed. He's come again, perhaps, to borrow something of yours. Be still, I tell you. My dear friend, Monsieur Jordan, how do you do? Very well, sir, to render you my small services. And Madame Jordan, how is she? Madame Jordan is as well as she can be. Well, Monsieur Jordan, you are excellently well dressed. You see? You have a fine air in that suit, and we have no in the court for a better maid than you. Well, well. Scratches him where it itches. Turn around, that's positively elegant. Yes, just a big a fool behind as in front. <laughs> My faith, uh, Monsieur Jordan, I was strangely impatient to see you. You are the man in the world I esteem most, and I was speaking of you again this morning at the chamber of the king. You do me a great honor, sir. In the king's bedchamber. Come, hold on. Sir, I respect I owe you. Heavens, put on your hat. Sir, I am your humble servant. Madame, I tell you, Monsieur Jardin, you are my friend. Sir, I won't be covered if you won't. I'd rather be uncivil than troublesome. <laughs> I am in your debt, as you know. Yes, we know it all too well. You have <laughs> generously lent me money upon several occasions, and you have obliged me with the best grace in the world to show it with. Oh, you jest with me, sir. But I, however, how to repay what has left me, and to acknowledge the favor is rendered me. I have no doubt of it. I want to settle this matter with you, and I came here to make up our accounts together. There, wife. Now you see your impertinence. I'm the man who likes to repay debts as soon as I can. I told you so. Let's see how much do I owe you. There you are with your ridiculous suspicion. Do you remember well all the money you lent me? I believe so. I made a little note of it. Yeah. Once you were given 200 louis d'or. That's true. Another time, six score. Yes. And yet another time, 140 louis d'or. You're right. These three items make 460 louis d'or, which comes to... five thousand sixty livres. The account is quite right. Five thousand sixty livres. One thousand seven hundred thirty-two livres to your loom maker. Exactly. Two thousand seven hundred eighty livres to your tailor. It's true. 4,379 livres, 12 souls, 8 deniers to your tradesmen. Quite right, 12 souls, 8 deniers, the account is exact. And 1,748 livres, 8 souls, 4 deniers to your saddle. If all that is true, so what does that come to? Uh, that some total of... 15,800 livres. Uh, the sum total is exact, 15,800 livres. Uh, to which I add 200 of the stores that you're going to give me, which will make exactly 18,000 francs, which I shall pay you with the first opportunity. Well, didn't I predict it? Peace. 
Will that inconvenience you to give me the amount I said? Oh, no! He's making a milk cow out of you. Be quiet. If that inconveniences you, I will seek it somewhere else. No, sir! He won't be content until he's ruined you. Be quiet, I tell you. You only have to tell me if that embarrasses you. Not at all. He's a real weasel. Touch shit! He'll milk you to the last so. Will you be quiet? I have several other people who gladly lend it. But since you are my best friend, I believe I might do you wrong if I ask someone else for it. <laughs> do me a great honor, sir, and I'll go get them for you. What? You're gonna give it to him again? Yes. Do you want me to refuse a man of his station who spoke of me this morning in the king's bedchambers? Go on, you're a true duke. I have a head that is bigger than my fist, even if it's not swollen. Mademoiselle, your daughter, where is she that I don't see her? Mademoiselle, my daughter, is right where she is. Yeah, how is she getting on? She gets on on her two legs. Wouldn't you like to come with her one of these days to see the ballet and the comedy they are putting on at court? Yes, we have a great desire to laugh, a very great desire to laugh. I think, Madame Chagam, that you must have had many admirers in your youth, uh, beautiful and good humored as you were. Well, well, well. Is Madame Chagam decrepit? And does her head already shake with palsy? Uh, Madame Chagam, I beg pardon. I did not remember that you are young. I am often distracted. Pray excuse my impertinence. There are two hundred louis d'or. I assure you, Monsieur Chardin, that I am completely yours, and that I am eager to render you service at court. For I am much obliged to you. If Madame Chardin desires to see the royal entertainment, I will the best places of the ballroom given to her. Madame Chardin kisses your hands. Our beautiful marchioness, as I sent word, will come here soon for the ballet refreshments. So I finally proper consent to the entertainment to which to get her. But let's move a bit farther away for a certain reason. It has been eight days since I saw you, and I have sent you no news regarding the diamond you put into my hands to present her on your behalf. But soon it desired the greatest difficulty in conquering her scruples, and it's only today that she resolved to accept it. How did she judge it? Marvelous. And I am greatly deceived if the beauty of that diamond does not produce for you an admirable effect on her spirit. So would to heaven! Once he is with them, he cannot leave them. Made her value, as she should, the richness of that present and the grandeur of your love. These are, sir, favors that confound me. And in the very greatest confusion, seeing someone of your quality demean himself as you do for me. Are you joking? Among friends, does one stop at these sort of scruples? And one is doing the same thing for me if the occasion offer? Oh, certainly, and all my heart. His presence weighs me down. As for me, I never mind anything when it's necessary to serve a friend. And when you confided in me about the ardent passion you formed for that delight to march us with whom I have contacts, you saw I volunteered immediately to assist your love. It's true. These are favors that confound me. Both who never go, they enjoy being together. You took the like tap to touch your heart. Women love above all the expenses we go through for them, and your frequent serenades, your continual buffets, uh, the fire, fireworks for over the water, the diamond she has received from you, and the entertainment you are going to give her, all this speaks much better in favor of your love than all the words you might have spoken yourself. There is no expenditure I wouldn't go to if by that means I find a road to her heart. A lady of quality has ravishing charms for me. This is an honor I would purchase at any price. What can we talk about so much? Steal over and listen a little. Soon enough, you will enjoy at your ease the pleasure of seeing you, and your eyes will have a long time to satisfy themselves. Be completely free. I've arranged for my wife to go off to dinner at her sister's, where she shall spend all the after dinner hours. Now you have done prudently, as your wife might have embarrassed us. I have given the necessary orders for the books and for the ballet. It is of my own invention and provided the execution corresponds. Say! To you. You're very pertinent. Let's go, if you please. Curiosity has almost cost me. But I do believe that there is something afoot. 
as I was speaking of someone else who I did not want you to be. It is not the first time Nicole I've had suspicions about my husband. I am the most mistaken woman in the world, and there's some love affair in the making. And let us see to my daughter, Lucille. You know the love Clayle has for her. He's a man who appeals to me, and I want to help his suit and give him Lucille if I can. I'm the most delighted creature in the world to see that you feel this way. For if the master appeals to you, his valet appeals to me no less. And I could wish our marriage may have a shadow of theirs. Go then, speak to Cleon about it for me, and tell him to come soon. We can present his request to my husband for my daughter in marriage. I hate to madame with joy, for I cannot wish for a more agreeable commission. I shall, I think, make them very happy indeed. I'm so glad to have found you. I'm an ambassador of joy, and I come- Get out, traitor. <laughs> Don't want to abuse me with your treacherous words. What? Is this how you receive me? Get out, I tell you. And go tell your faithless mistress that she will never again in her life deceive the too trusting Cleo. What caprice is this? My dear Coviel, explain a little what you're trying your to say. Your dear Coviel, go, quickly, out of my sight, Janice, and leave me in peace. What? You come to me Out of my sight, I tell you, and never speak to me again. My word, what plot is that, Nelson? Let's go tell the priest George my mistress. What? Treat a lover in this way? And a lover who is the most faithful and passionate of lovers. It is a frightful thing they have done to us both. I show a woman all the ardor and tenderness that can be imagined. I love nothing in the world but her, and I have nothing but her in my thoughts. She is all I care for, all my desire, all my joy. I talk of nothing but of her. I think of nothing but of her. I have no dreams but of her. I breathe only because of her. My heart lives wholly in her. And see how so much love is well repaid. I have been two days without seeing her, which are for me two frightful centuries. <laughs> I meet her by chance. My heart at that sight is completely transported. My joy shines on my face. I fly with ecstasy towards her. And the faithless one were to rise and hurries by as if she had never seen me in her life. And I say the same things as you. Coviel, do you want to see anything to equal this, this perfidy of the ungrateful Lucille? And that, Monsieur, of the treacherous Nicole? So many tears I have shed at her knees. So many buckets of water I have drawn for her. So much passion I have shown her in loving her more than myself. So much heat I have endured, turning the spit for her. She flies from me in disdain. She turns her back on me. It is perfectly worthy of the greatest punishment. It is a treachery that merits a thousand slaps. Don't think I beg you ever speaking in her favor to me. I, sir, never. Never are come to excuse the actions of this faithless woman. Have no. No, you see, all your speeches in her defense will serve no purpose. I agree. 
I want to conserve my resentment against her and end all contact with her. Uh, that's very well said. I agree. This count who goes to her house is perhaps pleasant in her view, and her mind, I well see, allows itself to be dazzled by social standing. But it is necessary for me, for my honor, to break the scandal of her inconstancy. I want to break up with her first and not leave her all the glory of dumping me. That's very well said. <laughs> and I agree, for my part, with all your feelings. Strengthen my resentment and aid my resolve against all the remains of love that could speak on her behalf. Tell me I order you all the bad you can of her. Make for me a painting of her that will render her despicable. <laughs> and show me, in order to disgust me, all the faults you can see in her. <laughs> Her, sir, there's a pretty fool, a well-made flirt for you to get so much love. I see only mediocrity in her, and you will find a hundred women who are more worthy of you. First of all, she has small eyes. That's true, she has small eyes. <laughs> but they are full of fire, the brightest, the keenest in the world, the most touching eyes that one can see. She has a big mouth. Yes. But upon it, one sees grace that one never sees on other mouths. And the sight of that mouth, which is the brightest, the most amorous in the world, inspires desire. Uh, as for her figure, she's not tall. No. But she is graceful and well made. Uh, she affects a nonchalance in her speech and in her actions. That's true, but she may be forgiven all that, for her manners are so engaging. They have an irresistible charm. As to a bit. Ah, she has that cobia, the finest, the most delicate. Conversation. Her conversation is charming. She is always serious. Would you have pretty playfulness, constant open merriment, and do you find anything more impertinent than those women who laugh all the time? Finally, she's as capricious as any woman in the world. Yes, she is capricious, I can see. But everything becomes beautiful, ladies. Well, <laughs> one suffers everything for beauty. I see how it is. You want to go on loving her? Me? I'd like better to die. <laughs> I am not going to hate her as much as I love her. How do you find yourself perfect? That is how my men will be more strength. And that way, I'll show better the strength of my heart. By hating her, by quitting her, with all her beauty, all her charms, and as lovable as I like. Here she is. For my part, I was completely shocked at her. They can only be a cold word. I don't even want to speak to you. Uh, let me take you. What's the matter? What's wrong with you? What grief possesses you? What bad humor holds you? Are you me? Have you lost your voice, Kobia? Is this not villainous? It's a Judas. I clearly see that a risky meeting has troubled you. Ah, she's here. She's done. This meeting this morning has annoyed you. She is against the problem. Isn't it true, Kobia? This is the cause of your resentment. Yes, perfidious one, it is as I am speaking, and I must tell you that you shall not triumph in your faithlessness as you think. I want to be the first to break with you, and you won't have the advantage of driving me away. I will have difficulty in conquering the love I have for you. It will cause me pain. I will suffer for a while. But I'll come through it, and I'd rather stab myself through the heart than have the weakness to return to you. Me too. <laughs> No, I tell you, no, it's better. No, I'm Beth. No, I wasn't listening. Two minutes. One minute. One moment. Never. Not interested. Two words. No, you have. Listen to me. No more talking. All right. Since you don't want to listen to me, think what you like and do what you want. Since you act like that, you wouldn't even like that at all. Let us know the reason then for such a fine reception. It no longer pleases me to say. Let us know something in the story. No, I myself, no one wants to tell you. Tell me. No, I say. Tell it. No, I'll tell it. For pity. No, I say. Have mercy. It's for you. <laughs> Thank you. Leave me. You see, I'm Nicole. Never. never. And thank God, I don't want to. Not to me. Definitely not. Clear out my doubts. No, I'll no. never leave my mind. No, I don't care to. All right. Since you are so little concerned to take me out of my pain and to justify yourself for the shameful treatment you gave to my passion, you are seeing me great for the last time. 
I'm going far from you to die of sorrow and love. And I, I will follow in steps. <laughs> Wait on, something else. What? Where are you going? Where I told you, we're going to die. <laughs> Yes, cruel one, since you wish it. Me? I wish you would die? Yes, you wish it. <laughs> Who told you that? Is it not wishing it when you don't wish to bear up my suspicions? Is it my fault? And if you wish to listen to me, would I not have told you that the incident you complained of was caused this morning by the presence of an old aunt who insisted the mere approach of a man on his woman, an aunt who constantly delivers sermons to us? Tells us that all men are like devils who must flee. There's the key to the entire affair. Are you sure you're not deceiving me, Lucille? Aren't you making this up? There's nothing more true. It's the absolute truth. Are we going to give in to this? <coughs> oh, Lucille! I will never admit to here to appease the things in my heart. How easily one allows himself to be persuaded by the people one loves. How easily are we manipulated by these blasted minxes? I'm very glad to see you, Clarence. And you're here at just the right time. My husband is coming. Seize the opportunity to ask for the seal in marriage. Ah, oh, madame, how sweet that word is to me. Can I receive an order more charming? A favor more precious? <laughs> Sir, I do not want to use anyone to make a request of you that I have long considered. It affects me enough for me to take charge of it myself. And without further ado, I will say to you that the honor of being your son-in-law is the greatest favor that I beg you to grant. Before answering your question, I beg to ask if you are a gentleman. Sir, most people don't hesitate much over this question. They use the word carelessly. They take the name without scruple, and the usage of today seems to validate the theft. As for me, I confess to you, I have a bit more delicate feelings on the matter. I find all imposture undignified for honest man, and that there is cowardice in disguising what heaven made us to To present ourselves to the world with a stolen title. Who is to give false impression? I was born of parents who, without doubt, held honorable positions. I have six years of service in the army, and I find myself well established enough to maintain a tolerable rank in the world. <coughs> but, despite all that, I certainly have no wish to give myself a name to which others in my place might believe they could pretend. And I will tell you frankly that I am not a gentleman. Shake hands, sir. My daughter is not for you. What? <laughs> you are not a gentleman. You shall not be having my daughter. What are you trying to say with your talk of gentlemen? Be quiet, my friend. I see what you're up to. And wasn't your father a merchant, just like mine? If your father was a merchant, so much the worse for him. But as for mine, those who say that are misinformed. And all I have to say to you, I want a gentleman for a son in law. It is necessary for your daughter to have a husband who is worthy of her. It is better to have an honest rich man who is well made than an impoverished gentleman who is badly built. We have the son of a gentleman in our village, both ill formed and the greatest fool I've ever seen. You always butt into conversation like this. So hold your tongue. I have enough money for my daughter. I need only honor. And I've decided to make her a marchioness. A marchioness? Yes, a marchioness. Alas, God, save me from it. It is a thing I have resolved. As for my part, it is something I'll never consent to. Marriages above one station are always subject to great inconveniences. And I have absolutely no wish for a son-in-law who can reproach her parents to my daughter. And I don't want her to have children who will be ashamed to call me their grandmother. And if she were to arrive in the equipage of a great lady and fail by this chance, to greet someone in the neighborhood, they wouldn't fail immediately to say a hundred stupidities. You see, they would say, this Madame Marchioness, who gives herself such glorious airs. It's the daughter of Monsieur Jardin, who was all too glad when she was little to play house with us. She hasn't always been so haughty as she now is, 
and their two grandfathers sold cloth near St. Innocent's Gate. They amassed a wealth for their children. They're paying dearly for it now, perhaps, in the other world. One can scarcely get so rich by being honest. I certainly don't want all that gossip going around. And I want, in a word, a man who will be obliged to me for my daughter, and to whom I can say, sit down there, my son-in-law, and have dinner with me. Sure, those must be the sentiments of a little spirit. Want to always remain in a base condition. So don't talk back to me. In spite of everyone, my daughter will be a marchioness. If you make me angrier, we'll make a duchess of her. Don't lose courage yet. Follow me, my daughter, and tell your father resolutely that if you can't have him, you don't want to marry anyone. You made a fine business with your pretty sentiments. What do you want? I have scruple about that which precedent cannot conquer. Don't you make a fool of yourself by taking it seriously with a man like that? And don't you make a fool of yourself taking it seriously? And would it cost you anything to accommodate yourself to his fantasies? You're right. But I did not believe it necessary to prove nobility in order to be much more shut down southern now. What are you laughing? The thing is that I just, an idea that I just came to me of how to lay our man a trick and help you obtain what you desire. Ha! The idea is very funny. What is it? Short time ago, there was a certain masquerade, which fits here better than anything. And then I intend to make part of a prank I want to play in our tour. <coughs> All seems a little phony, but with him, one can try anything. It's hardly any reason to be subtle, and he is the man to play his role marvelously and swallow easily any fabrication you want to show. Uh, I have the actors ready, I have the costumes, so let's go. But tell me, I will instruct you in everything. So let's go. There he is. Return. so many difficulties, and the experience you have with one marriage doesn't determine anything for others. I, I always come back to this. The expenses that I see go to for me disturb me for two reasons. One is that they get me more involved than I would like, and the other is that I am sure, maybe no offense, that you cannot do this without financially inconveniencing yourself. And I certainly don't want that. Oh, madame, they are trifles, and it isn't by that. I know what I'm talking about. And among other gifts, the diamond you forced me to take is worth. Oh, madame, mercy, don't put any value on a thing that my love finds in worthy of you. Uh, and allow. Here's the master. Step back here. 
madame. What? One step in, if you please. What is it? Just a back for the bird. Madame, Monsieur Chardon is very knowledgeable. Madame, it is a very great honor to me. Be fortunate enough as to be so happy as to have the joy that you should have the goodness to accord the graciousness of doing me honor, of honoring me with the favor of your presence. And if I had merit, to merit a merit such as yours, and if heaven, envious of my luck, should have seen me. Uh, Monsieur Chardon, that is enough. Uh, Madame doesn't like her own compliments, and she knows that you are a favorite. As you can see, this good ritual is ridiculous in all its manners. It isn't difficult to see it. Uh, Madame, he is the best of my friends. You do me a great honor, sir. A completely gallant man. I have great esteem for him. I have done nothing yet, madame, to merit this favor. Take care. Nonetheless, to say absolutely nothing for about the diamond that you gave her. Can't I at least ask her how she likes it? Taste it here? I mean, don't. That would be loudish of you. To act as a gallant gentleman, you must act as though it were not you who gave this present. Monsieur Chardin says he is delighted to see you in his home. He has me a great favor. I'm much obliged to you for speaking thus to her. Uh, frightful trouble getting her to come here. Uh, he says, Madame, that he finds the most beautiful woman in all the world. He honors me greatly. Madame, it is you who does the honors. And let's consider it. Everything is ready, sir. Let us sit there. Monsieur Chardin is right, madame, to speak so, and he obliged me by making you so welcome. And I agree with him that the repast is not worthy of you, since it was I who offered it, and since I do not have the accomplishments of our friends list in this matter, you do not have a very sophisticated meal. And you will find some incongruities in the combination and some barbarities of taste. If to me your friends had been involved, everything would have been according to the rules, everything would have been elegant and appropriate, and he would not have failed to impress upon you the significance of all the dishes of the repast. He would have told you about a fresh baked bread with its golden brown crust crunching tenderly between the teeth, of a smooth, full-bodied wine fortified with pecancy not too strong, of a loin of mutton and fruit with parsley, a cut of specially raised veal as long as this, a white and delicate, in which is like an almond paste between the teeth, of partridges complemented by a surprisingly flavorful sauce, and for his masterpiece, a soup accompanied by a fat young turkey surrounded by pigeons and crowned with white onions mixed with chicory. But as for me, I express my ignorance. And as Monsieur Chardin said so well, I only wish that the repast were more, were more worthy of being offered to you. I reply to this compliment only by me. Oh, what beautiful hands! The hands are mediocre, Monsieur Tatin, but you wish to speak of the diamond, which is very beautiful. Of me, madame? God forbid that I would wish to speak of it. That would not be acted gallantly, and the diamond is a very small thing. You are very peculiar. Well, you are too kind. Let's have some wine, Monsieur Chardin. I see something here, madame, yet more beautiful. Aha! Uh -huh. Monsieur Jardin is more gallant than I thought. What? Madame, what did you take Monsieur Jardin for? I would like her to take me at my word! Again! Oh, she may know me whenever it pleases her. Oh, I'm overwhelmed. He is a man who is always ready for the report to you. But don't you see that Monsieur Jardin, Madame, eats all the pieces of food you have touched? I am captivated. By Monsieur Jardin. If I could captivate your heart, well then I would be. Uh -huh. I find myself in good company, and I see I was not expected. Was it for this pretty affair, Monsieur Husband, that you're so eager to send me to dinner at my sister's? I just saw stage decorations downstairs, and here I see a banquet fit for a wedding. That is how you spend your money, and this is how you entertain the ladies in my absence. And you give them music and entertainment while sending me on my way. 
are you saying, Madame Giordano? What fantasies are you getting into your head about how your husband spends his money in bed with his he who is giving this entertainment to Madame? Uh, please know that it is I, that he only lets me assassin that. You want to think more about the things you say. Yes, what's impertinence it is the Count who presents us to Madame, who is a person of quality, and he only does me the honor of using my house and wishing me to be with him. All that's nonsense. I know what I know. Come, Madame Chiron, put on better glasses. I don't need glasses, sir. I can see well enough. This is very low of you, the great lord, to lend a hand as you do to the follies of my husband. And to you, madame. For a great lady, it is neither fine nor honest to cause dissension in a household, and to allow my husband to be in love with you. What does she mean by all this? Good Mr. Chiron, you have outdone yourself by exposing me to the absurd fantasies of this Ridiculous woman! Madame, wait, Madame, where are you going? Madame, Mr. Count, make excuses to her to try to bring her back. What's an impertinent woman? You embarrass me in front of everyone. You drive away from me people of quality. I laugh at their quality. Ooh, I don't know what stops me, evil creature, from breaking your head with the remains of the repast you came to disrupt. I'm not concerned. These are my rights, which I defend, and I'll have all laws on my side. You do well to avoid my rage. It came at a very inopportune time. I was in the mood to say pretty things. Who when I never felt so witty? What is this? I don't know if I have the honor to be known to you. No, sir. I saw you when you were no taller than that. Me? Yes. You were the most beautiful child in the world, and all the ladies took you in their arms to kiss you. To kiss me? Yes. I was a great friend of your late father. Of my late father? Yes. He was a very honorable gentleman. What did you say? I said that he was a very honorable gentleman. My late father? Yes. You knew him very well. Literally. And you knew him as a gentleman. We thought that. Well, then I don't know what is going on here. What? There are some fools who want me to believe that my father was a tradesman. Him? A tradesman? It's pure slander. He never was one. All that he ever did was to be very obliging, very ready to help. And since he was a connoisseur, in fact, he went all over to choose them, uh, had them brought to his house, and gave them to his friend for money. <laughs> well, I am delighted to know you, sir, so you can testify to the fact that my father was a gentleman. I've attempted before, all the way. Oh, now, you're blind, huh? What business brings you here? Uh, since knowing your late father, the uh, honorable gentleman, as I told you, I have traveled through all the world. Through all the world? Yes. I imagine it is a far way from here to there. Uh, surely. I returned from all my long voyages only four days ago. Because of the interest I take in all that concerns you, I've come to announce to you the best news in the world. What? You know that the son of the Grand Turk is here. Me? No. What? He was a very magnificent ceremony. Everybody goes to see him. He has been received in this country as an important lord. I didn't know that. Uh, the advantage to you in this is that he is in love with your daughter. The son of the Grand Turk? Yes, and he wants to become your son-in-law. My son-in-law? The son of the Grand Turk? Son of the Grand Turk, your son-in-law. And as I went to see him, and as I perfectly understand his language, I conversed with him. And after some other discourse, he said to me, Akeam prok saler ut alamustak gidelem amenahem varahini pusare kalbula. Which is to say, haven't you seen the most beautiful young person who is the daughter of Monsieur Jardin, gentleman of Paris? Oh, the son of the Grand Turk said that about me? Uh, insomuch as I said in reply that I knew you particularly well, and that I had seen your daughter, he said, Ah, Mano Balasa. Ma Which is to say, Ah, how I am enamored of her. Mara Baba Sahib means, Ah, how I am enamored of her? Yes. Though you do well to tell me, because I never would have believed that Mara Baba Sahib means, Ah, how I enamored of her. <laughs> oh, what an admirable language, Turkish is. Uh, more admirable than one can believe. <laughs> you know what Hakan Rakamujan means? 
array, and is this the time to go masked? Speak then, what is all of this? Who has bundled you up like that? See, the impertinent woman, to speak in this way to a, a mama uchi. <laughs> For I've just been made a mamamuchi. <laughs> what are you trying to say with your ma mamamuchi? Mamamuchi, I tell you. I am a ma ma mu chi. What animal is that? <laughs> mamamuchi. That is saying our paladin. Paladin? Are you of an age to dance in ballets? What an impertinent woman. I said paladin. Honor that has just been bestowed upon me in a ceremony. What ceremony then? Mahometa Perjordina. What does that mean? Vuole bar in Paladina de Giordina. What? Dar Turbanta con Galar. Which is to say what? Per defender Palestine. What are you trying to say? And then, Trinidad, we must try to help clean out his plan by supporting his masquerade. He's a very gallant man and deserves our help. I think highly of him, and he deserves happiness. So we have to, Madame, another ballet performance that we shouldn't miss, and I want to see if my idea will, will succeed. I saw magnificent preparations, and I can no longer permit this durant. Yes, I finally want to end the extravagances that I see you go to for me. I have decided to marry you. Right away. This is the truth of it. That all these sorts of things end in marriage, as you know. Oh, Madame, is it possible that you should have taken such a sweet decision in my favor? It is only to impede you from ruining yourself. Without that, I see very well that soon you would not have a penny. Uh, how obliged I am to you, Madame, for your eagerness to conserve my money. It is entirely yours, as well as my heart, and you may use them in whatever fashion you please. I'll make use of them both. But here's your man. His costume is wonderful. <laughs> Sir, I wish you the strength of Seraphims and the wisdom of lions. <laughs> Sir, we come to pay homage to your new dignity and to rejoice with you at the marriage of Queen Yudara and the son of the Grand Turk. I was very glad, sir, to be among the first to come congratulate you upon the rising such a high degree of honor. Madame, may your rosebush flower all year long. And I am infinitely obliged to you for participating in the ceremonies bestowed upon me. And I am very happy to see you return here so I can make very Humble excuses at the ridiculous behaviors of my wife. That's nothing. I excuse her for jumping to conclusions. Your heart must be precious to her. And it's no wonder that the likes of such a man as a you should inspire some jealousy. Madame, the possession of my heart is a thing gained entirely by you. You see, madame, that Monsieur Jordan is not one of those men that good fortune blinds, and that he still knows, even in his glory, how to recognize his friends. It is the mark of a completely generous soul. Where then? This is Turkish house. We want, as your friends, to pay him our respects. Here he is. I sent for my daughter to give him her hand. Uh, sir, well, we come to bow to your highness as friends and the gentleman who is to be your father-in-law and to assure you, with respect of our very humble services. Where is the interpreter to tell him who you are and to make him understand what you are saying? You'll see how he replies, and then he speaks Turkish marvelously. Hit him! Where the 
devil is he? Strief, strive, strove. Monsieur is a grande senor. Grande senor. And Madame, Dama Grande. Dama Grande. He, Monsieur French Mama Mouchy. And Madame French. Mama Mucha. I cannot say it more clearly. Oh, here's the interpreter. Where are you going? We won't know how to say anything without you. Tell me, that Madame and Monsieur here are people of high rank, that they have come to pay their respects to him as my friends, and to assure him of their services. You'll see how you're a la bala tropium, a keepin' on anapame. Catalequi tuba urin soter amal And You see? He says that the rain of prosperity is to water the garden of your family in all seasons. I told him that he speaks Turkish. That's wonderful. Now, come, come, my daughter. Come here. And give your hand to the gentleman here. Does you the honor of asking for your hand in marriage? What? Father, look at you. Are you playing in a comedy? No! <laughs> no! This is not comedy. This is a very serious matter, as full of honor for you as possible. Now, there is the husband I give you. To me, Father? Yes, to you. Now, put your hand in his and thank heaven for your happiness. I have absolutely no wish to marry. I wish it. I, who am your father. I'll do nothing of the sort. Oh, what a nuisance. Come now, give your hand. No, my father, I'm telling you. There is no power on earth that can make me take any husband other than Clarence. And I will go to extreme measures rather than... It is scary that you are my father. I am delighted to see you return so promptly to your duty. And it pleases me to have no feelings of daughter. What now? What's this? They say you want to give your daughter in marriage to someone in a carnival costume. To be quiet, impertinent woman. You always throw around your absurdities at everything. And there is no teaching you to be reasonable. It's you that there's no way of making lies when you go from folly to folly. What is your plan? And what do you want to do with this assemblage of people? I want to marry our daughter up to the son of the Grand Turk. To the son of the Grand Turk? Yes. Read him through the interpreter there. I don't need an interpreter. And I'll tell him straight to his face that there's no way he will have my daughter. What? Madame Chardon, you oppose such good fortune as that, that you refuse his Turkish Highness as your son in law? My goodness, sir, mind your own business. It's a great glory which is not to be rejected. Madame, I beg you also not to concern yourself with what does not affect you. It's the friendship we have for you that makes us involve ourselves in your interest. I can get along quite well without your friendship. Your daughter here consents to the wishes of her father. My daughter consents to marry a Turk. Without doubt. She can forget Cleon. What wouldn't one do be a great lady? I would strangle her with my own hands if she did something like that. Ooh, that is just so much talk. I tell you, this marriage shall take place. And I say there's no way it will happen. Oh, what a row! Mother! Go away, you are a naughty girl. What? Quarrel with her? For obeying me? Yes. She is mine as much as she is yours. Uh, madame. What do you want to tell me? A word. I want nothing to do with your word. Listen. <laughs> She will hear a word in private. I promise you to make her consent to what you want. I will never consent to it. Only listen to me. No. Listen to him. No, I don't want to listen to him. He's going to tell you. I don't want him to tell me anything whatsoever. Oh, there's that great stubbornness of a woman. How could it hurt you to just listen to him? Just listen to me. After that, you can do as you please. All right. What? For an hour, madame, you can sing with you. Don't you see that all this is done only to accommodate ourselves to the fantasies of your husband? That we are fooling him under this disguise, and that it is Cleon himself who is the son of the grandeur? 